Hey, Jonathan. <laughs> hey, Paul. Happy birthday, dude. Thanks, you man. You must be 41, because I'm 41. Because <laughs> this is our 41st episode of The Measure of an Episode, as you know, <laughs> where it's our continuing mission to explore what makes a Star Trek episode a proper, a genuine Star Trek episode, and not just pretend Star Trek, pretend science fiction. I'm Paul. I'm Jonathan. And we do this based on three criteria. The first one is, is there sci-fi inter... Oh, can't do it. Can't. What? <laughs> <laughs> Intricately threaded th- th- through the episode like a quilt. Fail. <laughs> uh, can, can the episode be played... Without sci-fi. And if the answer is no, then it is a Star Trek episode. But it must follow our third criteria, which is, is there some sort of ethical or moral dilemma that a character, whether it's the protagonist, the antagonist, some ancillary character is facing? And is that important to the episode? And if the answer is no, then it also is not a Star Trek episode. Very good. Very good. <laughs> and this week, I we, think that clears we it up. watched... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, what time is it? Uh, and this week, we watched Enterprise, Season 3, Episode 6, Exile. And I'll read the blurb here. A selfish prince is cursed to become a monster for the rest of his life unless he <laughs> learns to fall in love with a beautiful young woman he keeps prisoner. Because <coughs> it's like Beauty and the Beast, Jonathan. Yes. This is the exact plot line to Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> or Phantom of the Opera. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wait, does he hold what's her name prisoner in Fan of the Opera? Yeah, kind of. Um, he like, well, yeah, I mean, he, he doesn't he doesn't actually abduct her, but he plays his beautiful music and she is drawn to the music and she goes missing. Uh, all right. I'll read the real one. Hoshi Sato is contacted by a 400 year old telepathic alien exiled on a planet in the expanse, shunned by his society because of his abilities. That's what really happened. Interesting. But the first blur. But the first blur was 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 better. Far more accurate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that. That's like, hey, here's all the sci-fi stuff about the alien. Doesn't really tell you what the plot is, though. No. There's a there's a B plot happening that isn't. I don't think it's a B plot or an A plot. It's sort of they're just two plots running in parallel here that are, both have equal significance or equal insignificance. <laughs> <laughs> well, I um, think one is one is the episode and one is the story, like the series arc. Yes. Yeah. So that that sort of is is becoming more it, more prevalent in these enterprise episodes because as it becomes more serialized, mm-hmm. we're kind of I I I feel like we get into it. And we're, I feel like we're jumping into the action. I'm like, oh, good, we're right into it. And then I'm like, well, no, this is just a continuation of the previous episode. I just don't know what the <laughs> hell is going on. <laughs> well, except, but her her storyline was the the episode arc. Um, it just happened to be. You know, so they, they jump into her stuff about just this weird guy creeping on her in, in her room. Um, but then right. after the the amazing guitar lick and the awesome theme song, um, then it went mm-hmm. into the, mm-hmm. the series arc um, stuff, you know, which, again, was stuff that you, you know, they start talking about the, the Zindi right away. And they say, well, was that, this was kind of cool because the, it did require you to be watching continually because they don't talk at all about who the Zindi are or why they're chasing them. You know, they just said this is where the the Zindi sphere was. The right, the death tickle? is that right? <laughs> yeah, which we've talked about before. Yes, Hoshi <laughs> gets contacted by this alien telepathically, and we have to go through this rigmarole that happens a lot in in episodes like this, whether it's Star Trek or not, where something real happens that she can't that can't be corroborated by anybody else or anything else, like mm. a computer or something. Oh, right, right. And right. so mm-hmm. we have to go through this whole thing of like. Look, I'm not crazy. It's like, are you sure you might be a little stressed out? Maybe you should take some, you know, have some milk at night and try and. and it's like, no, this is real. And then it happens again. It's like, no, this really happened, and we have to do this for 15 minutes before we actually get to the plot. Right. No, that's like, a really good point. Can't, yeah. we, can't we just skip this part and get to the the fun stuff? <laughs> it's like the I'm going crazy trope. Am I going crazy? And that's that's the thing about the the TNG episodes. Let, let's not do this like right at the beginning. But that was so nice about the TNG episodes because like when they when they did play the crazy stuff, it was always explored. You know, like they they said, "Am I crazy?" And they're like, "Well, let's explore it." You know, let's let's see. Like we're in space, anything can happen. Let's find out if you are crazy or if this is actually going on. 
or the episode literally revolved around their craziness. Like, I think it happened twice to Riker um, and Beverly with, like, her remembering crew members and them disappearing. Like, that, the whole episode is based around them being crazy and, you know, and right. it's not, it's not nobody believing them for the first 15 minutes and then them being like, you know, see, I was right. So, yeah. yeah. And I like those episodes where we know that Riker is going to be back on the bridge the next episode. So the fun of those types of episodes where their reality is in question. Um, and, you know, I think Deep, Deep Space Nine had that very famous one where it, it, the whole episode takes place in the 50s or something like that. And we, we call into it's called into question the actual reality of Star Trek in that point. Yes. And so it's fun to see how are they going to – it's not so much are they, but how are they going to get back. To speak to this episode, I mean you, you hit the nail on the head with your with your blurb. Like the 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 Hoshi story is – well, it's it's Beauty the Beast up to a point. Like she she never falls in love with him um, and she she threatens him to to get out. It felt very – even with the, the, the Mist-esque kind of sets that they built for this guy's planet – Oh, it felt right, like right. when they mm-hmm. when 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 the away team gets to this guy's planet, and you see that sort of hallway and that kind of very, I don't know, medieval esque kind uh-huh. of out, out exterior, and you go and it feels like a game. You ever played the game Mist? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It took me a second to figure out what you're talking about when you said Mist esque, but yeah. No. I yeah. Mist yeah. and Riven. Yep. Yeah. Mist and Riven and Exile. Oh. Oh. This is, <laughs> oh. That's where they got the idea from. <laughs> At the end of the episode, when she got back onto the Enterprise and they had the little Zindi tag at the end where he came into her her quarters, uh, if they had cut that off, at the end, I I was feeling that this would have been an original series story. I could absolutely see this whole thing playing out almost exactly uh, with the original series characters. Right. And so let me just quickly... Just just to bring our readers up to speed. The first plot is the one with Hoshi. She gets contacted telepathically to come and, I guess, visit this alien who can help them find this Zindi weapon. And ostensibly, that's why, she contact, that's why he contacted her. But really, he wants a companion to live out her entire life on this planet with him because he gets lonely. And so uh, things sort of escalate as much as they can. Uh, by the way, there is a scene where Hoshi, she... She's sort of, she's been there and she's like settled in, but then she starts walking around this, this house in an evening gown and uh-huh. high heels. Oh, I missed the high heels part, but yeah, it was, yes, it was an outfit that I was like, you, you look very comfortable. Yeah. I thought it was going to be some sort of like, he was making her look this way. Right. I thought it was all going to be some sort of mental construct. Anyway, we'll get that in a second. So that's the Hoshi plot line. The other plot line is the Archer takes the Enterprise to go investigate this whole Zindi Spheres thing, which they find, and Chip and Archer have to go down to the surface, and there's sort of a, an adventure. And these are the two plot lines running in parallel that seem to have equal time and are both equally as neglected as plot lines. Like, th- this should have been two episodes. Because, okay, so I- I'm going to say that I feel like this is a-, a proper Star Trek episode that I did not like. Yes, I would agree with that. So, okay, so we got that out of the way. Now our <laughs> listeners know what's going on. There's really nothing else to the plot lines in this. Nothing, right. there's, no, there's no inner, right? There's nothing else happening. On, there's no subtext. It's all just text. Yeah, yeah. So let's so, see what we're watching next. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> the Archer Enterprise. No, you didn't like that? Fine. <laughs> no, it's good. I get, I get a chuckle. I'll put in a, I'll put in a bigger chuckle. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll cut off the audio. Like, <laughs> uh, well, don't put me laughing at it. <laughs> <laughs> or if it's not enough, I'll just loop a, a very short, brief chuckle. Like, so it's like, ha <laughs> ha, you should loop that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, keep it for like um, 10 uh, seconds <laughs> <laughs> so okay so back to the hoshi thing why is she walking around in evening wear and high heels when she's obviously uncomfortable and it, i never get the sense that she's sort of settling in it's like hey i kind of like this guy we, we miss that whole arc mm-hmm. right where she, she he ingratiates her himself to her and she's kind of feels comfortable kind of what happens in in beauty and the beast right where she starts to feel comfortable and then that's when you bring on the crazy well they skipped the i'm starting to feel comfortable part 
and they just brought on the crazy right away. Yes. No, I would I would agree with that completely. Yeah, the the they he did not get into her good graces enough for it to be a real struggle for her. Like she was just waiting for her captain. You know, what what would have been great is if the what were they called the the gravimetric warps or whatever uh yeah. they if it if it impacted their their time you know and so like they were expected to be back in three days but it's been two weeks or three weeks or something like that right. you know and right. he's he's starting to say like you know could it could it be possible that you know something happened to them on the way to the sphere um you know and she then she really had to struggle with like you know, should she start to get comfortable here or should she wait on them? Well, I mean, so to jump to the to the end, I thought where it was going, and frankly, I think it would have been a much better ending, is that she, it feels like she's been there only for three days. But in reality, she's been there for years and years and years. And the Enterprise has been looking for her. Mm. And he just made it seem like, because, you know, he's like a, a master telepath. Right. Right. He can do whatever he wants. However he manages to do it, they finally rescue her. And, you know, uh, Archer maybe looks a little bit older or at least months and months or something like that, where you can justify, you know, just this weird or even just longer than it seems like she's there. And then well, yeah. and then it's just sort of like, oh, wow, like, oh, this is a big deal. But you would you would have had to have spent more time at his mist house for that to really hit home because, mm-hmm. right. I mean, the, the episode is like 40 minutes long and half of the episode is dedicated to hijinks with Captain, Ar- Captain Archer. Mm hmm. Well, yeah, and I think I think the other way around would have been better if it felt like it had been much longer for her. And they come back, you know, and they say it's only been the three days. Um, and you know, and then then she has mentally acclimated and gotten comfortable there. And then, well, and then she finds out that you know she's only been there for three days, and he, she's been lied to this whole time. Then then the betrayal would be far more uh, yeah. relatable, understandable. At a certain point, we're supposed to sympathize with whatever the alien's name is because he's all by himself, which, by the way, why don't you just ask for a ship? I mean, maybe you can't go back to your home world, but go to one of the many other millions of planets that exist where are, there are people. Yeah. And he's in exile, but not only from his planet. <laughs> you right, go right. To other places. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're not going to know because no one else is telepathic. Um, but anyway, so it starts to feel like a lifetime movie. So, uh, a quick note about the Zindi artifact. And I know that the more episodes we do, the less this is going to be weird, coincidental, because, you know, we'll just, odds will run into these things. But we, we are still, we are at f- just over 5% of all of the non-current live action Star Trek shows. Okay. And right. the prop that he is looking at was the cloaking device in Profit and Loss, and it was the heating coil mm. in Live Fast and Proper. That's awesome. <laughs> Just sort of an orgy of past props. Well, yeah, of episodes, episodes that now? we have seen. Yeah. What's that percentage? Right now. Give it to me. I just told you. It's percentage. over 5%. Oh, it's- did you do that? But when you gave me that, had you worked it out, or was it off the top of your head? Well, it was roughly off the top of my head because 10% would have been 70. And so 5% would be 35. That's where I got there. Brilliant. (laughs) Thanks. I didn't hear you give the percentage. That's funny. Anyway, you you just um, tuned me out. You were just waiting for me to get to my point. I just, I like, I was sort of processing, like sometimes there are gaps in what I hear because I'm sort of either waiting to like, I'm think trying to think of something to say, or I'm just sort of just processing what you said. And I will just, there'll be gaps. Like like sophomore year, <laughs> <laughs> just processing what everyone was saying. Oh, that's interesting. I, right, I know. Like it, it just it's crazy how this keeps happening. And I mean, you know, we we haven't seen Loxana for a little while, but there was that run where she's in like seven episodes, and we've already seen four of them or something like that. <laughs> yeah. It is strange, almost like it's being done on purpose. Right. <laughs> I thought this was going to be more of a horror episode absolutely yeah i did too because the way that that the alien i mean okay i know the alien is supposed to be crazy um but at the beginning we he's kind of putting his best foot forward because he wants to bring hoshi to the planet yes so why do this thing where you're hiding in the shadows why don't you why don't you just appear and say like hey i know this is alarming but look this is this is the situation i can help you find the zendi thing Sorry, I've been reading your mind for the past couple of days. It's the only way I can. I'm I'm exiled on this planet, right? For some reason, you know. But that's my tale. It took. It's my thirty second spiel. If you'd like my help, uh, here's my coordinates. Right, and that's all the time I have. Yeah. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> 
But why do this thing? Because why do this horror trope thing for the beginning of the episode? So we have to go through the rigmarole of I think I'm crazy. Well, you're not. You just need to. Mm-hmm. You just need to take some time. You haven't been sleeping well. Well, especially if he's making himself look human. Like why hide in the shadows? Yeah, exactly. Or why not make yourself look like Archer and send the ship there? Just order the ship. I guess you can't do that, right? Because it only worked on Hoshi. Yeah, right. Only and, works on Hoshi. Yeah, and then and then I actually thought of that. <laughs> What? Well, it was it was not just a plot hole. It was actually something that they they handled. Like, why wouldn't they just take over Archer? And oh, I see. There, right, right, right. Yeah. Um, well, and then out. well, what's funny too is they so he's hiding in shadows as human, and they get to the planet, and he's in the light as the alien. Like he wasn't hiding in shadow, was he? I don't think he was when they when they first no, got he there. He just turns around. Yeah. So I don't know why why do this horror thing. I don't know. It just right. seems like they were, they tried to fit so much into this episode that it didn't need. Mm-hmm. And and therefore watering down the actual hard hitting you know plot lines that they were trying to get to, and I don't know I just there was never a point I, I felt afraid for Hoshi because oh how you know, she's all kind of all by herself and is at the whim of this guy's m- mind who can do anything to her mm-hmm. he could basically lock her in a room for the rest of her life you know in, in her mind basically um, yeah I don't know they, they he was kind of a toothless character yes right. he was lying to her. And yes, he tries to manipulate her in the, I don't know, the, the most perfunctory way by impersonating Archer. Mm-hmm. But in terms of what crazy people can do, if given the power of, oh, I can make you think you're, you're seeing anything, pretty toothless, right? Even for an episode of Star Trek. Well, yeah, and I think, I think that's part of why this felt like an original series episode was because he, he did not feel overly threatening to her, but he was powerful enough to take down the Enterprise, and then sh- yeah, I was half expecting that to happen. Like that, like they were like when they when the Enterprise left, that they never left. They were just sort of just drifting adrift, sort of in their own like weird states of of mental whatever. Like, oh my and gosh. all in fugue right. states, you know? Right. Well, and uh, but that didn't happen. Right. And then and then what I expected was they you know they found out about the spheres. I was expecting the the book that she was reading and translating to show that that was the alien race that built the spheres. And she was going to come to them and tell them how many were built. And the, you know, oh, cool. the Zindi like kind of found them and took them over rather than them building all of them. Right. Or just I like the idea of making it be part of the story instead of just sort of like, well, how did, what did you think of the ending? Uh, it was OK. Right. End of scene. Right. right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> or I, I could have been something where the book was the Enterprise somehow trying to communicate with her in, in her in her mental fugue state that he was he had locked her in. Oh, I see. I see. Okay, not the actual ship, but the people on the ship. Okay. Okay. Right. Right. Not the computer, but right. but they, it was their way of trying to get into this this cage that he had locked her in, this mental cage. Mm-hmm. But I mean, none of, it's just very like nothing happened. They had such a good opportunity. Even when they sit down to have dinner together, it was so just stock. Right. right? Well, when I was a boy, uh, I my you know like whether it's like oh you like pizza. Hey, she likes pizza. Isn't that interesting that she likes pizza and because i like pizza too how about we have a scene where she eats some pizza well and then you know i uh, my my stomach is a little unsettled yes that's what you did, used to tell your grandmother when you didn't want to try the soba noodles and now it's one of your favorites <laughs> i'm surprised again because i just remembered that you've been reading my mind for the past three days right is this going to keep happening stay tuned <laughs> so it was like a blend between the original series and voyager Insofar as there were all these potential ideas and they just delivered it in a horrible way. Just in a disappointing way. And what this did was they felt the need to address and tend to this plot line that goes nowhere. It's just, I mean, the, nothing happens to Hoshi. There's no, there's no arc. Nothing, nothing. But then the other plot line, which to me is infinitely more interesting. Yes. Uh, they water that down too because then it'll have the time. Right. So this is the, this is the, the science fiction-y section that that it, to me makes it meet our criteria uh, criteria is one two and three um <laughs> this, this hit all three wow <laughs> <laughs> to hit all three of them as i said before archer and trip they take a runabout to go find the sphere which they find and they can't of course they can't scan it or do what they wanted to come do so they want to land on it so they can fix whatever they need to fix so they can scan it and then something happens to the ship where it ejects itself off the surface and because of, of a, I guess a thruster is broken yeah. or something like that. Yeah, I was like, oh, on, this is on permanently. Yep. And so this is where I was like, I was glued to my seat because I was thinking, oh, finally, this is going to be a fun 
kind of procedural science fiction-y section of the show where it's not really plot oriented. This is a, how do they get out of this mess? Yes. And because they can't contact Enterprise, right. they're only in spacesuits, and the ship is, they cannot reach the ship. It's, it's floating off into space, and they have to act. I thought, oh, this is going to be the, the A plot. And then two and a half minutes later, they've fixed the problem. I was like, oh, well, that, that kind of sucks. No, that you're, was a very uncreative way. Yes, and you're, you're wrong. It actually was not two and a half minutes. It was 45 seconds. Right, exactly. I, I was giving it the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, of <laughs> gripping you to your seat at least a little bit longer than you thought they did. But no. I, um, I must have fallen asleep. <laughs> you were processing um. it. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, and the, the part – so that part kind of – threw me off a little bit because if when they when they shot the the forward thruster and they disabled it 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 came crashing down you know like it it did not come down as if it was on earth you know it didn't come crashing down and damage anything it kind of bounced on the surface so you know there was there was some level of gravity there but not not a strong one but it looked like and i could be wrong about this that when the thruster turned on it was kind of spurting it wasn't on continually and it never lowered itself when the thruster went off and so it just kind of continued to drift for farther and farther away and so what i thought was going to happen is kind of what you were saying they would they would blast it and turn off the power thruster but now it's just kind of floating in that space and they had to figure out how to get up to it or bring it down to them and, and yeah, it didn't make it didn't make sense from a scientific standpoint, right? I, I, you're right. If they were they were in a microgravity environment where it was like being on the moon, right? Where you can you know you can hit a golf ball miles and miles and miles, but it will eventually come back down. It just will take more time than if you were on Earth, right? Same thing here. When the thruster turned off, it should have at some point, unless it went into orbit, a very low orbit, come back down to the surface. Yes, um, it didn't do that. Did it? It did come it back float. down, but it right. It didn't float. It, it came back down, but it just it it came back down faster than it should have if the one thruster, the one forward thruster, was turned on. Exactly. Yes. And so, wouldn't it have been fun to see like how are they going to get this now unreachable? Their their only way off, their only way to survive is on this ship that is floating a hundred feet above their heads that they cannot, they have no way of getting to. And that would have been fun to see them figure out how they're going to do that. Right. But then they just sort of get out of it where it just falls back to the ground. Yeah. I, I don't know. It was, it was very disappointing to me. <laughs> not... So have you seen The Martian? Uh, no. But, that, but is that more what you were expecting? I, I'm familiar with The yes. Martian. Yeah. Yeah. I was too. Yeah. The Martian is basically that, like little scenarios of him having to figure out in a very science fiction-y procedural way of how to solve them. And, and that's what makes it very entertaining. I mean, the book is the same way. The movie is very faithful to the book in that sense, but we didn't get that because no. we had, they felt the need to go back to this stupid Hoshi plot line. I think that Hoshi's time could have been shortened if we had seen significant moments with them together, you know? Uh, and so like we could have expanded the time with the enterprise on the sphere or the shuttle on the sphere and showed them kind of working through how to get it off um, or get get up to it, and we could have shortened the time with Hoshi and the alien, and Tarquin was his name, um, and shown those moments where, like, she'd been with him for two months now, six months, a year, and, yeah. you know, and, yeah. like, we don't know how much time has passed with the Enterprise doing all these things, and they get there, you know, and they say, okay, it's been three days, you know, and she's like, what are you talking about? You've been gone for two years. I never expected to see you, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I, I mean, that would have been great. I mean, what it could have been, to take it a step further, where... Every time we cut back to Hoshi, um, she seems more distant or she, she's she's very different, at least every time we cut back to her in that house. And we don't know why. There's something going on. It's it's, it's enough. Uh, her her demeanor, her her look, maybe her hair is, is shorter or maybe a little bit longer. And her look is different. And what we find out as, as the course of that plot line goes on is that she feel, she has been there for in her own time for years. Right. Years and years. And, and so, but we don't find that out until the end. Like it sort of all clicks into place. And that would have just been more fun. It would have made that scenario more interesting to watch than just, oh, he's just going to hold her prisoner now. Exactly. Yeah. We, we, we could have fixed it. They just hired us. <laughs> if they just filmed the episode, shown it to us, and then we talked about it, we would have made it so much better. <laughs> so that, the science fiction, it was enough for me that they, they had sort of the microgravity, th the thing with Archer, where mm -hmm. they had the microgravity mm -hmm. conundrum. Um, that was enough to satisfy the science fiction-y part. 
And the, also the part, I guess there, there was a, a sense of morality from Hoshi that was happening where she, I guess at a certain point, had to decide if she wanted to help this person or, you know, or also the morality of just holding, lying to somebody and holding them captive and whether or not that makes them bad. I mean, a, a good or bad guy. I can, you kind of can't blame. In, in, the, in the scenario that this person, that he could not leave, he was unable to leave and he was there by himself. Can you really blame him for doing what he did? Right. But the question I so, you know, kind of like the paradise syndrome, like was that was that presented in the episode? Now hearing you say that, I'm kind of like, eh, we're it's definitely there in the fact that we're projecting it onto him. Like he was supposed to be the we were supposed to sympathize with him, but it wasn't I, I don't feel like it was presented in a way that it was, you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't a debate at all. You know, she she never said, I, I hope you find someone. Well, in, in a way, though, it, the morality was not it was not presented as though it was a conundrum for Hoshi. It was it was presented as what's his name? Dart Mock? Tarquin. Uh, Kana. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Jalad. That, that it wasn't it was <laughs> it, it was for him. It was I've already done this. And for me, I don't like the morality is I care more about myself. I've been here for 400 years or so, and yeah, I'm willing to sacrifice you for the for the ability to have a, a companion. And I, that that's sort of how how I took it that he was he he had he, I guess he was amoral. He wasn't immoral right. to himself. It was more of an amorality that he that he had seated himself in because I guess he went crazy. But if you're if you're a I guess you would anybody would go crazy if you're alone for that long. Except me. I feel like that would I would do that for a couple hundred years. <laughs> Bell four four would be good. Yeah, I, well, yeah, he was. I, I guess the part was actually in the argument. You know, if you destroy that, then I'll I'll keep you here. You know, and the Enterprise won't be able to get you. And she said, for what sixty, seventy years, and then you'll be alone for the rest of your life. Do you really want that? You know, and that's kind of when it when it dawned on him that it was better to let her go and possibly find another than right. Yeah, than to keep her. <laughs> and uh, another co- moral moral conundrum is that. She essentially traded places with his next victim. She sacrificed yeah, the next right? person mm-hmm. for herself, right? Yeah, that's a good point too. Oh, maybe she's not the not the person we thought she was. <laughs> They're both being selfish there. Yeah. Well, it's too bad that, that they didn't make that a thing. That she wasn't kind of torn up about that. that right. I basically traded places with the next person to save myself. Mm-hmm. And uh, but they, I guess, they just didn't have time because they needed to have a runabout bouncing around on the top of a sphere. Well, yeah. And, you know, they could have said something about how like she she goes back to what she said at the very beginning, you know, like you she tells him you need to be up front and, you know, let the people know what you are looking for and, you know, and have him kind of kind of be like, I, you know, I, I understand that now with you leaving. Like, I can't feel like I try to trick them into staying, you know, just have them just have a moment of like forgiveness and sympathy for each other rather than her leaving him creeping into her room and he's like this will be the last time i promise because his promises have been so great so far <laughs> i promise because you'll be at a range yeah, right. <laughs> yeah i can't do it this episode you know as as overall disappointing as it was this is the kind of star trek that i like and it's the kind of star trek that i'm hoping brave new worlds will be and it's what i was hoping picard and discovery and maybe lower decks is i don't know but um where there is the episode issue that they have to deal with, and there's the series arc issue that they're peeling a little bit more back on. And I feel like that's where Star Trek really has the ability to shine. And, you know, and I think that Enterprise did for a little bit, um, but I think Picard is way too serialized, as is Discovery. And I don't know about Lower Decks, but but yeah, just having that conflict of the episode is really fun because then you can be done, but then there's that other thing in the background where if you want to know more about it you can continue watching it's yeah i think for me it it almost if they had had the courage to be more patient with their plot lines mm-hmm. speaking to this one and and in general like in something like picard where okay so you have this heavily serialized narrative it it sort of prohibits you from be, being able to be patient with a plot line or just even a scenario where an entire episode is about trying to get to the, my ship, which I can't reach, which is a hundred feet away. Right. How do I do that? Right. And that's, that's the interesting part of science fiction for me. And sometimes they do that in next gen. They probably do that the most in next gen, but they almost got there with this one for me. As like, I kind of am in agreement with you about 
this is where science fiction can shine mm-hmm. or Star Trek can shine. Yeah. So, all right. So overall checks off the boxes, but it was just not, not a good episode. Yeah. I didn't no, It's not a good episode, but a proper one. Nonetheless. All right. So let's see what we're watching next. Alter ego episode 14 of season three of Voyager. And the blurb says Harry Kim finds himself in love with Morena a character from Neelix's Polynesian Resort holodeck program. <laughs> God, I hate these episodes. At this point, hadn't Next Gen already explored everything there was to explore about characters falling in love with holodeck characters? Hadn't we just done it? We've done it, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, Jord- Jordy does it multiple times. Yeah, that's what I'm I mean, talking Who else would I be talking about? <laughs> it would be funny, though, if somebody fell in love with a a hologram version of Jordy. Why didn't they do that? That would have been interesting. They've never done that. Where somebody, where one of the characters... Harry Kim falls in love with Jordy. <laughs> no, not Voyager, where like they're, they can't see them, but where one of the characters on the crew that we're following goes to meet somebody who has fallen in love with their holo- holodeck character. Yeah. That would I be mean, cool. Just, just that do, never happened. That would be cool. That, yeah, that will never happen. I, I mean, it could. They want, like, I, I could totally see a Lower Decks episode doing that. Oh, the one just before the Fair Trade episode yeah. is a way more interesting episode. <laughs> way more interesting. Ah. Actually, all of them. All of the ones that I'm looking at on the screen <laughs> that aren't the one we're going to be watching, way more interesting. See, but it's uh, maybe. But it's season three. Like, I feel like they should be away from what is Neelix? A Tarlaxian. They should be away from all the Tarlaxians at this point. So it just. No, yeah. I mean, you're right. It, I, yeah, it, it is weird that he keeps running into his own race. Yeah. Was his was his like was the whole planet destroyed or something like that? Did that happen? Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. But I'm not I don't sure. care. Don't answer it. I don't care. Even if you know, don't. Okay. Eject. <laughs> Whoa! Dying warlord takes over Kess's body and is determined to reclaim his home planet. Anyway, we've got like so many episodes yeah. to get to. Yeah, Chakotay and Janeway crash on a planet and are stuck inside a time in which Janeway dies. Why can't we watch that? That's cool. Well, because you know it'll be super disappointing. We get to watch Janeway die (laughs) several times. Over and over and over. (laughs) Uh, But no, to watch Harry Kim fall in love with the holodeck program. Okay. Well, let's go watch it. No. Okay. (laughs) Dude, should we? Yeah. (laughs) No, I refuse. (laughs) 